Hello and welcome to Required Reading, the podcast that revisits the most impactful books from our childhood. I'm your host, Erin Bowles. I'm a writer, actor, and devastated little reader. Today is our 10th episode and it is a doozy. We have not one but two guests and not one, not two, but three books. Our guests today are Maddie Hart and Kira Sullivan. Maddie performs comedy all over LA and hosts the Chicago Tens and Big Sour. You can follow her on Instagram and TikTok at Maddie Hart underscore soccer. And Kira Sullivan is a Brooklyn-based comedian and is hosting a show on October 26th, the day after this comes out. And she's at Super Kira on all socials. And today's book is The Hunger Games Trilogy by Suzanne Collins. Before this week, I had only ever seen the first movie on DVD once. I'm in love. This is so good, guys. Wait, you had never... That's actually... Wait, that's actually so exciting. You read these books for the first time? Mm-hmm. You had never read these books? I didn't know that. I had never read these books. Wow. Um, I only knew Josh Hutcherson from Bridge to Terabithia, which is in two weeks. We're doing that soon. And I knew that he was from Kentucky because my parents are both from Kentucky. And it's a trait of them just being like, George Clooney, it's a good Kentucky boy. Jennifer Lawrence, good Kentucky girl. So you didn't just, even go through like the Josh of her phase, the Josh Hutcherson, Jennifer Lawrence shipping phase. I don't know that I clocked that. If you search up Josh for on YouTube, you will see compilations with like 12 million views of them in interviews. I'm serious. It was a movement. Mm-hmm. My entire TikTok feed is Hunger Games edits right now, which is different oh. than like Josh Hutcherson, Jennifer Lawrence shipping, but just like so much Peta and Katniss on my TikTok feed right oh. now. Like, to different songs like I keep getting that song <laughs> let me know if you guys are on this side of TikTok I keep getting that song that's like there will be a poet and then it's like there's like I keep getting that song with like different sets of characters and the edits are like prescribing who's the poet who's the king and who's the soldier or whatever and I keep getting those specifically with like Hunger Games characters and I watch everyone I'm telling the algorithm like yes more 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 because I watch every single one to the end so send those links to me because I'm I need to get on that side of TikTok immediately come on over get to the side get to this side and Gail is the soldier (laughs) so the books came out 2008 9 and 10 had them just boom 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 and like I don't know I was into the archery of it all but I never read the books my mom was like I'm gonna we're already diving very deep into Girl Scout lore but In Girl Scouts, you have badges and you have patches and basically anyone can make a patch that goes on the back of your jacket. And my mom was like, I bet I could write a Hunger Games patch set of activities and then sell it and get money. So she did it with that. She did it with like, and so we had watched it for research for that. But I meant to ask each of you, what are your stories with this book? How did it come to you? How did this start? So I'm obsessed with the Hunger Games. Like my whole thing with the Hunger Games is that this book is gonna be and like should be taught in high schools as part of like dystopian like commentary and allegory and stuff. Like it actually blows my mind. I mean, I read these when they came out. Like I was such a little, you know, bookworm and loved all of like the YA, like Divergent, like all of those books. I mean, I still love all those books. Like I I really just read them right when they came out and I was obsessed, but it's honestly taken on a new meaning for me as I've become an adult because I have very severe insomnia, like really severe. Now I'm on medication and stuff, but for like years, I just fell into this thing where I could not fall asleep unless I was listening to the Hunger Games audiobooks. Like I literally had to listen to them. Some people have podcasts, some people have like YouTube videos, but I literally had to listen to the Hunger Games every single night. Wait, I'm looking up the voice actor's name. Yeah, I have to ask. She's amazing. One second. Oh my God. Yeah. The voice on Audible of the books Tatiana Miscellany um, yeah she has the most like calming soothing voice ever and it's a book that I was familiar enough like I know everything that's gonna happen so it's kind of white noise but what is so funny about it is that I was dating the same person for years and so he sort of got used to that and it was like part of the nightly routine like pop on the hunger (laughs) game so then when we broke up and I started like casually having sex with people again like it was really like the first time I like had sex with somebody and then it was like we were gonna sleep over together and I just like automatically put on the hunger games (laughs) (laughs) 
and I like went to go to sleep and they were like what the fuck and it's literally like the, like, okay. the most gory thing ever it's like Katniss like you know blood streaming down her face like as the knife slices her brow like it's like so gory but to me it's just white noise and I just remember being like oh I guess it's actually kind of weird that I can't go to sleep unless I listen to Tatiana McSlaney's rendition okay. of the Hunger Games but so I probably listened to them 30 times through each like maybe not that much but I like have big portions of the book memorized just because I've fallen asleep to them for years and years but honestly so rereading them like actually reading them this is the first time I've done that since elementary school and it was just a completely different experience and I feel like I discovered new things so yeah wow that is like you you I feel like are going to be our our main source Mm -hmm. Uh, the amount of knowledge you hold um (laughs) I'm a Hunger Games brainiac. Kind of same. Like I was at that age where like it came out in elementary school. Like I remember reading it in like fourth or fifth grade. So I was like exactly at that age to like eat up teen dystopia. I also like read all the Divergent books. I did the whole thing. I was obsessed with the books. And then also my little sister was obsessed with them. And she did like didn't really like she wasn't like a big reader. And then she got into these and it was like the first books she actually liked. And we really bonded over it. We were both such Hunger Games stands. But then also the movies came out. Mm-hmm. And again, I was like right at that age. I was probably like 12 or 13 when like the first one first or second one came out Mm -hmm. Um, so again I was like at the sweet spot for all of them but then also the movies are so good on a cinematic level and me and my little sister rewatch the movies like at least once a year and like for the books I have this with Twilight too every two to three years I'll just get this like itch Mm. where I'm like it's time to return to this land and I reread them I love it I remember after the first movie had come out, I did a summer program at a college. And I remember one of the RAs who was super cool, like asking me if I had seen it and stuff. And I was like, um, yeah, once I don't remember it, but the sound design was really good. And you could see him like mentally, like give me a gold star. And he was like, that's a really good comment. (laughs) I I could, yeah, I could analyze this is for a different podcast, but I could analyze the cinematic choices of the Hunger Games movies for hours. I love the Hunger Games movies. And like, they're some of the only books that have like translated well into movies. And like, I get such chills, especially like in Mockingjay, like just all of that footage. And it's like the rebellion and everything. It's like, they do it so well. I get chills. Suzanne Collins is a screenwriter and it's written in first person present tense and it reads like a screenplay and you're just like ho, 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 which is why as you were saying it as an audiobook I was like not only is it that it's like my forehead gets slashed open and I feel my blood dripping from my eyes <laughs> Good God. no seriously Tatiana Miscellany is literally as much Katniss to me as Jennifer Lawrence is it feels like she's Katniss when she's reading the books on Audible like she deserves an Oscar for her Audible acting I meant to ask about the movies have you ever watched Buffy oh uh, sorry did you say Buffy the Vampire Slayer yes because that is my favorite tv show of all time oh my it's- gosh me too like, that is the show I've watched the most out of anything in the world I was born like six months after the show had started. My parents had not seen it. And then my mom is in the recovery room, like having given birth to me. And she turns on the TV and it's Buffy season one, episode three, The Witch. And she's like, we should watch this when we get home. And day one of my life, she's been there. But the guy who plays Jonathan in Buffy, who, Maddie, you haven't seen it, right? Mm -mm. The show at all? So Jonathan is like this really wimpy kid who goes to high school with him and then like comes back later trying to be a supervillain. He either wrote or directed like the last two of these movies. And that's my favorite fact. Danny Strong. That is crazy lore. Um, (laughs) If you saw the actor, you would know exactly who he is. He's like plays the like kind of like nerd character and so much like so many 90s films like if you ever watch lizzie mcguire it's like um ethan tudgman larry tudgman excuse me cool but that's i gotta watch that that though there's so much to unpack with this like my little sister is obsessed with the hunger games in a way that like i haven't quite reached even though i really love the books and i texted her last week and i was like i'm going on a hunger games podcast let me find the yeah I said, need your Riley expertise. 
I'm going on a podcast this week where we talk about the like Hunger Games series and like I just want to like refresh so I have some stuff to say and she texted back in all caps I am here and then he <laughs> FaceTimes me this is after like three weeks of her ignoring my FaceTime calls and we, we literally had like an hour-long discussion analyzing the books we could talk for hours about it this book has yes. so much to dissect it is such a an extremely well-written book I wanted to talk about Suzanne Collins a little bit her bio so she's the daughter of an air force officer and grew up moving around a lot and she says that his career gave her a lot of insight into like poverty starvation effects of war and she started her career writing for kids tv clarissa explains it all oswald little bear she met children's author james proimos while working on a wb show in the early 2000s the first book is dedicated to him and she wrote this five-part ya series before this it's about a boy living like in a subterranean world under new york and she co-wrote the first movie that came out in 2012 and in 2016 she was awarded the authors guild award for distinguished service to the literary community and this was the first time it was ever given to a ya author and the first book comes out from in 2008. The top song is Low by Flo Rida. And I think the year is best summed by this NBC News quote, collapses of Wall Street giants, huge stock market losses, plummeting home prices, and a surge of foreclosures, desperate times for U.S. automakers. It added up to the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression and will cost the federal government well over $1 trillion in various rescue and stimulus packages. So that's where we are. I forgot that she wrote Gregor the Overlander. Yeah. Oh my God, you know the lore. Wow. Yeah. I completely forgot. I think I knew that years ago. That is actually unbelievable. Those books are insane. Oh my gosh. The little free library on my street has the second one. And I've just been st- like waiting for the yeah. first one to appear. But no, no luck yet. No luck. That is such an interesting thing that you mentioned. At 2008, so I was probably not when it <laughs> came out. So like at the perfect age to like read the first one. But then also the fact that when you're like nine, you don't, it's not like you understand the economy. Mm -hmm. But my parents had the news on every night. Like you're old enough where you're understanding that like something's wrong around you. Everyone seems very worried all the time. And like, you know that like things are not going great. Yeah, I so clearly remember starting sixth grade in the fall of 2008 and like really genuinely believing since Obama got elected like we're fine now like that was it and now everything's gonna be okay let's just dive into the first book I've got my little notes and I noticed that I took way more notes at the beginning of the book and the end of the book and the middle I was just like (laughs) breathlessly enthralled can't can't even think can't even stop to take notes Gosh, I mean, there's just so many places we could start. I mean, I took notes too. I'll be looking at my phone. I mean, one of the first notes I took is just about obviously when it opens and it's, you know, reaping day. And like one of the first things that I noticed that maybe I didn't really notice as a kid because I wasn't reading it as a kid as such an allegory about like our own world and like Mm -hmm. inequality, et cetera. But like the whole thing with the tesserae and like Gail is angry at Madge and there's that scene that really hits me that like now that I'm older where it's like Madge it's the day of the reaping and she's rich obviously she's the mayor's daughter and she's like well I have to look nice in case I go to the Capitol and he's like well you won't be going to the Capitol and it's this bitter moment where it's like even though it's technically anyone has a chance to go obviously it's disproportionately like the poor people who are going to end up going and then Katniss has this really good first person commentary where she's like but even Gail knows that his anger is misplaced the tesserae is just a way to have us not trust each other and be divided and I'm like wow that just feels so fitting and apt and like maps onto our own world so perfectly in terms of like class divisions and like that was one of the first moments that hit me in the book Yeah, that's, like, so poignant of, like, you can understand logically that, like, this person is not who's keeping you down. Like, you can understand logically that, like, the forces that be want you to be angry with them while also still feeling completely angry with them. Like, it's very hard to, like, sort emotions logically in that state. And it's a kid's book and we're here. I'm baffled. This is like a children's book and it's like, here's how to do civil disobedience in extremely, extremely detailed ways. And here's what to do after that doesn't work. I feel like we, can we talk characters? That's like also like what my little sister and I talked about. We really like went in. Hey Mitch, Mm -hmm. let's talk about Hey Mitch. 
Hamish is like the most interesting character to me. Yeah, like he's probably like my my favorite in terms of just like the depth to him. And like in book one, he's so grumpy, obviously, but his lore and backstory Mm -hmm. is crazy. I think he probably has the craziest backstory of anyone. Mm -hmm. And then I think also in the backstory, I don't know if this is revealed in book one, Mm -hmm. but like the way he won his games, which was like a quarter quell so yeah double it was like double yeah. yeah and he won but the way he did was like he just kept walking and he got to the edge mm-hmm. and then he realized like there was kind of a dome he basically used the force field to like kill the other people but I think like because he had like used the game to his advantage mm-hmm. and, like, fished for it so like his family was killed and then like for the next like 20 years of his life he has to like mentor these kids and they die every Every time year could you imagine for like 30 years straight like anytime you like let your broken heart open up a little bit it's shattered again that's how he enters the book like that's the image that Katniss meets that's crazy that's that's the start of the character arc (laughs) yeah I think I think the idea of us like dissecting by character is honestly like a really good idea. Yeah. Like there's just so many things. Yeah. Hamish, especially like and Peta says, or maybe she says it at some point, but the idea that, you know, Katniss and Hamish are the same, it, it's totally true. Like they're both survivors mm-hmm. and they're both like people who survived about outsmarting and using the capital. And like I just think that those like parallels are so interesting. And like they both have like this attitude of I don't want to fall in love with anybody. I don't want to make any friends. I don't want to connect with anybody because I know that that's just going to hurt so bad you know Hamish chooses to never get married never have kids because he doesn't want to like send his kids to the hunger games he doesn't want whatever and like same with Katniss it's like she's like Mm -hmm. I can't even consider Peta and Gail because it's like that means opening myself up to having a family and that means opening them up to the hunger games like these characters Mm -hmm. are so so guarded and they're so like it's just they're in so much pain and like and that's why it's like then Peta's like kind of the light between them Mm -hmm. but I just I really love thinking of Hamish and Katniss as like on parallel journeys it's so true of like Hamish and Katniss are such mirrors of each other but also when you think about it Hamish as a tribute is kind of the best of both worlds in terms of Peta's strengths and Katniss's strengths yeah he has all of Katniss's strengths and kind of like none of her weaknesses because he's also like really politically smart and like socially smart and she's very like because she's so hardened kind of in a similar way but like she's kind of naive uh, mm-hmm. like like I love her to death but like she is kind of a dumbass sometimes I think it's like she's very much a hunter and like yeah. she's very much in like the next 24 seconds I think yeah because that's survival yeah. and yeah yeah but the way that she takes on like really weak people and stuff mm-hmm. I mean it always works out for her I guess but I I get what you're saying like her soft spots get the better of her but what I will say and this is a slight pushback is Hamish makes that alliance with that girl and then does go to save her even though the alliance is open which is mirror to Katniss reaching to save Rue and it was too late but I get what you're saying because I still think you know Hamish has that strategic side socially that Peta has and Katniss doesn't so I totally agree but it's just there's that really painful moment where he does try you know he does reach out and call out to that girl and he wants to save her even though the alliance is over Um, and that's a very Katniss thing as well yeah it's been beaten out of him you know that was something in this I like I could not stop reading I could not stop reading and I I was also like, I don't want to hurt more than I am, but it's so good when I'm in so much pain. (laughs) They're so affecting and they're so visceral. I feel like we're going to be talking about Katniss, like the whole thing. Of course. I mean, yeah. I think it's time we talk about Mr. Peta Malark. My husband, my baby. Peta, if I entered the Hunger Games, I would definitely be like a Peta core. He's a baker's son, but he is so smart. It's so funny. And this is, like, kind of the, like, Katniss, like, not getting social cues when she gets really mad at Peta when he's like, I like her. And then she's like, oh, my God, like, you're out to get me. And Hamish is like, you fucking idiot. He just made you desirable. Like, he just gave you the biggest gift ever. But also, like, how is Peta so good at that? Yes, I was, like, rereading some of the very first chapters today. And I was like, I don't get how you make him. 
Yeah. Gosh. Okay. PETA is actually complicated because he's He's presented as this really kind boy, really whatever. But like you're saying, Kira, like he is actually pretty strategic. And I think it's interesting. I almost think it's like, it is hard to know when what he's saying is true and when Mm -hmm. it's not true. Like I honestly, and I want to talk about this. This was a question that I wrote down. Like, why does he team up with the careers? Like, that's a question that we can get to. But like, he is interesting. But I do think that what his strength is, is that there's always a grain of truth in everything he says. So I don't know if a hundred percent in love. With, I I know that he obviously is into Katniss from the very beginning, but I don't know if it's like a hundred percent the devoted love that he does portray to the Capitol. But I think like one of his strengths is that he almost knows where and when to reveal his true vulnerabilities. Mm-hmm. Like I wrote down this thought where I was like, Prim and Peta are kind of parallels. Like if Hamish and Katniss are sort of parallels, like I see a lot too. Yeah. And like. Peta versus Prim like in Prim's the same way like Katniss has this line where she's like Prim the same girl who like cried and cried that I might kill her cat is the same girl who can like stitch up and like stomach buckets of blood when it comes to healing somebody and I see that energy with Peta where it's like yes he has this baseline very kind soft energy but he also knows how to grit his teeth and like kind of survive and push through and like even kill when he needs to. And so it's interesting to me that Katniss has this tie to both Prim and Peta. Like I, I do see some parallels in them as being the innocent characters, but they also both have this kind of cutting underside where they also do know how to survive and use their own strengths. So I think that's interesting. But yeah, Peta's honestly confusing because sometimes he really does seem so snaky. He's a smooth talker. He is manipulative when it comes to talking with the capital, obviously like there's an edge to him but also the first moment we ever learn of him is him saving Katniss so we do know that at his core he's really kind and soft but even then that involved sorry now I'm going on this tangent even him saving Katniss with the bread involved him lying to and manipulating his mom so it's like we almost see that like everything soft he says or does is underlined with a like a slick snaky underside and Mm -hmm. I don't know there's something in that I feel like I don't get like snaky vibes Hmm. what I get is like his form of survival is very different to Katniss's of like Katniss's form of survival is very straightforward and blunt but he can't really do that like he's kind of too soft to do what Katniss can do so instead his form of survival is kind of like moving in between places or like bending rules or like kind of like lying or something or like playing the social game I could see how in like a survival situation if you weren't someone like Katniss if you couldn't like just really do what she does Peta's game of like politics or just like the social game like he probably survives most off of his like social skills Mm -hmm. than anything else but what you said about prim is so true but also i think it's so interesting because like prim is like the person katniss loves the most in the world and that's because she's seen as like so innocent and like kind of like purely good and i have to bring this quote up i have to read it out but it reminds me of like one of the like last quotes in the book when she's talking about she says that she doesn't want gail gail has too much fire and then she says i have plenty of quote What I need is the dandelion in the spring, the bright yellow that means rebirth instead of destruction, the promise that life can go on no matter how bad our loss is, that it can be good again. And only PETA can give me that. And I feel like that's so true. Like just even the association of PETA with bright yellow, I see that so clearly of like, because all these characters are good, like Hamish and Candace, even the hardened ones are good who like they'll save others. But PETA has this kind of, I don't know, it's not like positivity or like optimism. I don't know. What do you guys think? It's like this other thing. He has like a sense of peace about him. Like when they're in the cave, I love that quote at the end of the books. And like when they're in the cave and he's holding her in the sleeping bag, she says like, I have not felt this sense of safety since before my dad died. Like nobody has ever made me feel this safe, like as just being in Peta's arms. And I feel like she does come to value that more and more over time. Erin, you looked like you were going to say something. Sorry. No, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. I like when I was looking, um, I was just skimming it this morning. I was looking um, for things like that. Like you said, when they're on the chariot, I think she, I can't find it now, but she like reaches out for him and holds his hand. And she's like, he's this strong as a rock and he's going to. Here, I'm glad now I have Peter to clutch for balance. He is so st- steady, solid as a rock. And I was like, what a, 
I really, really, really identified with Katniss. I was like, this is a very special character to me now and I'm taking her personal. In the early chapters, they say her birth date. I think it's like May 8th, but she's a Sagittarius. I'm sorry, I have to take her. She's <laughs> a literal archer. She has to be a Sagittarius. But I was like, I feel like Peta's existence for Katniss is just saying like, you can rest now. Like, you can take it easy. Like, you can go to sleep and I'll take over for a little while. And like that... Oh, what a gift, what a gift from one human to another. Yeah, and I think it's also interesting, like, circling back to, like, the way Peta in his own form rebels. Like, in the second book, during the during the training thing when he paints Rue, like, mm. he makes a really beautiful portrait. But, like, what he's saying with that is, like, fuck you. Look what you did to this girl. Like, you killed a little girl. And so, again, it's, like, he uses things that we don't think of as, like, rebellious or brave, I think, to like send his message, which I love him and I love him and Katniss. That's so true. Like I was thinking about each of their different like weapons almost like yeah. this, like Katniss is this hunter and like Gail is, I have a thought on Gail, but like he's, oh. you know, Gail is amazing at traps. Like that's the whole mm-hmm. thing. Katniss over and over is like, I could never have like the balance and like planning that Gail does with his traps. She's like, he's a good trapper. He's a good trapper, which obviously comes back to haunt us when sorry, he traps Prim, blows up Prim and a bunch of other people to trap. Lest we forget. Lest okay. we forget yeah. he blows up her Ooh, sister. Pooch on that one. I, yes. Let's when circle he, back to that later. When yes. he's hot, but he kills your sister. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> hot body killed my sister. Yeah. But but going off the rock imagery, he saw it as a rock. He blends in like he camouflages himself. Like he's there. He's a part camouflage. of camouflage. Sorry, go on. Yes, camouflage. Like he literally fucking paints himself as rocks and dirt and stuff. Like he's solid. He's of the earth. Like he's grounded. Yeah. In a way that Katniss like needs. One of my literal notes was Peter Mullerk, kick bus. I feel like we've touched on it, but we haven't gone deep into it. Like, one of the reasons why I feel like Katniss is such a lovable character is, like, her dialogue is so beautiful. It's so simple and honest. But especially, like, in terms of her relationship with Peta, it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of, like, for the longest time, she hasn't had, like, the baseline met. And so kind of, like, in the second book, when she suddenly has all those needs met, she's experiencing, like, desire for the first time. And it's really beautiful to... It's really beautiful, and it's a testament to Suzanne Collins's writing that we understand what she's feeling, even when she can't accurately describe what she's feeling, even when she doesn't know what she's feeling. Like when she kisses Peta and she's like, I felt hunger before, but I've never felt a hunger like this. And I was reading the book and I was like, you're horny, Katniss, like Katniss, you want him. But like, she she doesn't know it. And of course, like, why would she? Like, but it's really beautiful to like, kind of like hear or kind of like get a firsthand glimpse of Katniss experiencing kind of beautiful emotions for the first time or like Mm -hmm. emotions she's never gotten to feel. And I feel like a lot of those new emotions emerge specifically with Peta. Yeah, he's the hope and the dandelion. He really is. That That dandelion imagery just from the very first book, she saw dandelion and knew it was hope. And like at the very end, that's what it is, is I think Peta, Peta's hopeful like yeah. I don't know if he's like positive he's not like cheery but he's just hopeful that the world can be better and that like you know that they can be I don't know content in some way but yeah, yeah. He's amazing but but I really do I am confused every time what his angle is when he joins the careers and I do know obviously later Katniss says it's a throwaway sentence later where she's like I'm realizing that you know he must have been playing the like romantic angle for all it's worth like he must have been making it seem like he was in love with me even when he was teamed up with the careers but I guess I'm just always like what do we think he was doing like what do we think during that time like how was he playing up the romantic angle like I'm just always a little caught at that moment yeah I think because I read them like all three of them so back to back like no second in between them I ended up really blending like in the second book everyone is really clear about like Peta is like I'm in this just to protect Katniss and Katniss is like every single thing is just about protecting Peta so I think for me I like had copy pasted that of like that point he's just like whatever I can do to get this end goal but I think you're right in that like I don't know 
what necessarily that end goal is because like you're 16 you're in a battle to the death for a girl that you have a crush on but like is that enough are you that wily but also he is yeah and it's I don't okay know have, totally I just my don't baby know. Yeah, he is, baby. I don't know if he could have foreseen the rule change. That was like completely oh, yeah. unprecedented. That's completely unprecedented. And he even said to Katniss on the roof, he's like, when it comes down to it, I will kill. Like, I don't think he has completely counted himself out of the game. So like, what is the point of, I don't know. I guess I'm like, is he, at that point when he's with the careers, is he playing for himself? Or is he at that point trying to save Katniss? I don't know. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's really hard to tell when Peta is playing for himself versus Katniss with every move in the game because with every move in the game you're like you can see how that helps him but you can also see how that helps Katniss so is he aware of that but I think because Peta is like characterized as so strategically smart I feel like I'm sure there were probably other methods for him to like survive in the game he could have used perhaps I feel like he strategically, just based off of like the character, like what we know of him, I feel like he's the type of person who like is going to come up with a strategy that's going to help him and also Katniss. The career thing was always a little bit interesting. Yeah. Did he like approach them and be like, guess what? It's all fake. But then the cameras probably would have caught that. Or was he like sneaking off to... Like, I recently read this audiobook. It's called Small Game by Blair Braverman. It's basically like you're on Survivor, but the it's a dark thriller. And they'll have moments where they're just like wandering up to like a camera in a tree and like saying things to like knowing it's going to be used for the show. So it's like, and I think like Katniss even does that with the salute to Rue when she dies. Like, so is Peta just going out into a forest, like giving them footage about like writing poems about her? Right. I don't know. Is he doing his own? like confessionals I was literally he's like yeah so anyway he's like going behind a tree eight four in the cornucopia (laughs) yeah when this book came out I remember like perceiving it or like thought the big cultural message was like reality tv is bad and the last writer strike was 2007 to 2008 the first book comes out in 2008 and a huge part of that last strike was when there was nothing on we had this new thing called reality tv that we could just flood everything with but it's all it's about so much more than that but I yeah I mean I think that's part of it in here like I I totally like that's like even if it wasn't inspired by like you know reality mm-hmm. TV becoming a thing I think just this idea of like I think about this a lot like one of the pilots I've written is like literally about like reality tv and how dystopian it is and i do think that hunger games like captures that just because it's like we make these people suffer and it's for our enjoyment and we don't see them as real people it's like i feel that way when i'm watching love island like i love when they fight and freak out and have heartbreak you know i I do think that there's totally an element of that and yeah i was actually thinking on this read through i was like i literally would read this entire book again from the perspective of what the games looked like like what I literally wish I could watch the games. Like, I wish I could, like, see what they were seeing because I just, I wish I could get the commentary. I wish I could see, like, Prim and, you know, Katniss's mom watching it together and commenting on it together. Like, I almost wish the whole thing could be written in another version that's, like, through the point of view of watching because I think that would just be so interesting. I think it's also, like, it's the whole point of the games from the capitals perspective is really interesting to me of like they say it's like basically to punish the districts mm-hmm. for rebelling for rebellion that's not a that's not a word rebelling okay. <laughs> but it's also like specifically to like dehumanize the people of the districts it's it's always so interesting to me how going into the games they have these interviews that are specifically meant to humanize Mm -hmm. the tributes. Like you get to know them. You get to know their likes, their dislikes. Like you feel like they're your friend. And then they go into the Hunger Games and like you just watch them be like become completely dehumanized so quickly. And the capital must understand that like that does so much in propagating like their propaganda Mm -hmm. like it was always so interesting to me how they made sure to like humanize the tributes before throwing them in to where like you want to see them kill each other and they basically just become like fighting machines yeah which I was thinking about that earlier today of like how 
it was a bad idea to do Hunger Games All-Stars in the second book. Like, of course, you take these districts' children and you slaughter them year after year after year, and sometimes they survive, and you parade them around the country, you make us feel proud of them, you take away everything else, all we have are these heroes, and then you want to take them away again. Like, how... Like, I don't know that we have national heroes like that. Like, yeah, it's also such a bad move by the Capitol. Mm-hmm. All those, like, winners of the Hunger Games, these are people with nothing to lose. Yeah. If you won the Hunger Games, like, the Capitol's taken everything from you. Like, Finnick Finnick is basically, like, a sex slave. Like, everyone, like, Joanna, like, she says in books, like, too, she's like, I'm not afraid. Like, they've already taken everyone from me. Like, Mm -hmm. there's no one left I care about. Like, why would you choose to, like, pick on specifically, like, the people who are at, like, the very end of their rope and have nothing to lose going against you? And the people who, like, know you best. Like, who... Yeah, they know all your little tricks. Yeah. No. But I also wonder, like, is it a thing of, like, well, if we toss them all in a bowl, only one's gonna come out. Like, do they believe in their own system that much? Yeah, I think it's a miscalculation. Like, I think that they're, like if we show them that even the strong you know this is the whole point of them, <laughs> yeah like, to show you that even the strongest are nothing compared to the capital like I guess that's their mo but they just underestimate one how attached people are to these victors and two the fact that these victors don't they just have nothing to lose and so it's like they're willing to die that's just so yeah and I think like Katniss and especially with Rue, I could talk so much about Rue. Rue is kind of the catalyst for like everything that happens in the book. The revolution, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about Rue. Yeah, the revolution of like, especially with Katniss, like she's kind of going in to survive. But then she sees this like young girl who's a kid, who's kind and sweet, who kind of has that like that prim pita mentality of like, oh, this is someone who's like fundamentally good. Like mm-hmm. Katniss, like this is someone who's better than I will ever be. And I will protect you at all costs. I feel like she is at her best and her deadliest when she's protecting someone. Yeah. And the thing that the capital can never account for is like people like Katniss and people like Rue of like when Rue dies, Katniss mourns her. Like she does the flowers, she holds a burial, but then, and she's willing to sacrifice herself for her. But then also like that kicks off this other thing of Katniss protecting Rue in the end when Clove is about to kill Katniss and she's bragging about killing Rue. She's like, we're going to kill you just like you killed your, your, like your little friend. And Thresh, picks her up and throws her against the cornucopia and he's like did you kill her say it and he the way he like bashes her head in but then also turns to Katniss and is like just this one time because of Rue that connection of like first Rue to Katniss but then Katniss to Thresh is the first connection we see of like cross district alliances Mm -hmm. based off just like love and sacrifice and loyalty and the fact that it happens with like district 11 and 12 is so telling I want to hear your thoughts on it though I feel like I just rambled for so long no I like I literally have chills thinking about it like I literally just got full body chills (laughs) I'm not kidding like it's amazing I mean like you were saying like the prim like quality yeah I mean like the first moment of descent that we see in these books is when Katniss takes Prim's place, protects Prim, and then nobody applauds. And everybody Mm -hmm. stands there and they do the freaking little finger thing. And that is the first moment where we see people, exactly what you're saying. They're like, Katniss is maybe not somebody we would usually like care about, but like because she stood up for the right thing, like because Katniss said this isn't okay, we're going to also dissent. And it's the the exact same thing with like then the Rue moment, like she protects Rue and she does this burial and whatever. And like Thresh and not just Thresh, but all of District 11 sends her the bread. Like there's that solidarity and that there's that alliance that grows. And like, it's just a freaking match being lit high, catching fire as hell literally spreads because it's like it's just undeniable it's like these people like prim like rue like when they're these just like fundamentally good innocent children like to watch katniss almost make the template for like what it looks like to take care of someone like that Mm -hmm. is just like inspires a movement or whatever but also the thing with the and this is one of my favorite elements of the whole book in terms of like what gives me the most chills is that Hotness really is just a match to an already burning situation. Like, 
And that's kind of dehumanizing. And that's, you know, that's in the third book, we realize that she's getting used by President Coyne in a different way. But it's like, it's unlike, you know, Harry Potter, where it's like Harry Potter was the chosen one, the boy who mm-hmm. lived, or, or even Divergent, where that protagonist is like, she's, you know, Divergent, and this is like a whole thing. It's like Katniss actually wasn't special. Katniss just sort of became this figurehead for a movement that was already happening. And it's like, and again, this is like later, but even in the third book, she's not even at the final fall of mm-hmm. the capital. Like, it's like, she's actually so irrelevant. And I think that is such an interesting thing because she turns into a weapon like she who is this girl who just stood up for her sister that's the only reason she's here and then she stood up for Rue and that's the only reason District 11 cares about her like she's only here because she's actually like a good person herself but the way that her image gets spun is she becomes just a weapon and she becomes just a tool and she becomes just this cold mocking jay like killer whatever like that's the image that she gets from President Coyne but the actual heroic elements of Katniss are the elements like saving Prue, saving Rue, saving Peta, like those softer elements get like torn away because they don't care about that. She's just a weapon. She's just Mm -hmm. like this face for a movement that was already underway. And I just think that is, it's so depressing to think about. And it's, it's so interesting. You bring that up of like them marketing her as like this, like basically killing machine. Cause it's like the reason she is so dangerous is because she sacrificed herself is because she was kind like that's actually like what lit the spark of the whole thing were these moments of kindness where she saw someone who was like smaller than her who couldn't fight back and was like I will lay down my life for you and that's what hardens even the toughest people like Thresh is a tough guy when he kills Clove he like bashes her but even he is like I'm not gonna kill you just this once because of Rue and I think it's her kindness that actually touches everyone and it's again like such a weird thing that they do of like turning her into this like symbol of violence when the stuff that she did that started this all were acts of kindness yeah well yeah like President Coyne just misses the mark that's why President Coin like isn't fit to run either because she completely just misses the point like exactly what you're saying like Katniss it's her kindness and her love that got her to be such a powerful person and like such a force to be reckoned with but Coin just completely obliterates all of that and just makes her this like killing machine and and that's why Coin and a lot of this rebellion also doesn't work because they also miss that mark Aaron sorry I think you were gonna no no I get so passionate about it no that's what we're here for I feel like in the first book it's this beautiful like rule of threes where to Prim in volunteering, she's like, I will die for you. And with Rue, it's like, I will live for you. And with Peta giving the berries in the end, it is that sort of third thing of like, I will die with you in order to give everyone this thing. And it, it really is those moments of generosity. And like from the beginning, she set up, I had highlighted this line of like, I'm not the forgiving type. And the first book in some portions can read like a little heavy handed. Very rarely though, I'm never going to criticize this book. But I think it's such a great way to set up like a YA character of she wants to be better. I think that's like one of the most universal things you can be is like to have flaws, to be aware of your flaws and devastatingly aware of your shortcomings to meet those expectations. And like, and every day waking up and being like, fuck, I'm a shit, but I'm going to try real hard for the people around me. And I just felt like what a, what a great character and what a great character to like give to young people. She is the best protagonist I've ever read. Ever, ever. Ever. I will never be mad at her. No, she's the best protagonist. She's the best written protagonist. And I just read another book that I really like, Fourth Wing, if you guys have read that yet. I've heard it, yeah. You gotta read it. it (laughs) It's really good. You gotta read it. It's like the new kind of dystopian YA thing. But I read that book and I was reading it and I was like, wow, this is a really well-written protagonist. And then I reread Hunger Games and I was like but nothing compares to this like Katniss just because we see all of her flaws we see her journey we're so in her mindset like we see the way that she's hurting we see the way that she's never been taken care of once in her life but then we see the way that she realizes she shouldn't be blaming her mom like she's so complex and she's she feels like a 16 year old being so angry at her parents you know it's it's just she's so well written also like the thing about Katniss setting the spark is like 
it really is like a string of sacrifices ultimately yeah. it's like because the whole point is like in hunger games it's every man for themselves but once you see someone else sacrifice themselves it changes like the entire game like the fact that in book two half the tributes go in being like the goal is Katniss lives I'm going to die like that's also crazy yeah. that like they won the games and they fully are going back and prepared to be like, I'm going to die for her. Like it really just shows you like the power of like seeing one person Mm -hmm. like do it. And especially because like, again, like what you were saying, like the mocking Jay, the way they use her as propaganda is so interesting because these moments of kindness are what lit the spark, but also they were never in service of like a bigger picture. Yeah. She like couldn't have been the mocking Jay if she knew. Yeah. Yeah. she didn't volunteer for Prim to like stick it to the capital. She did it so her sister wouldn't die. Like she didn't protect Rue with any kind of foresight of like a mocking Jay revolution. It was like, I'm gonna protect this child and I'm I'm grieving her. And that's why she's such an interesting character, especially to become this figurehead of the revolution, because she's the figurehead while also really not knowing at all that the revolution is going on. Yeah. She doesn't even, like, she resists the revolution in the first book. Like, we could leave, and she's like, well, we shouldn't. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. and there's all those moments. And, like, even, like, in the second book, when President Snow comes and is like, you better quell the revolution or else I'm going to kill PETA and your family or whatever. And she's like, okay, I'm going to do everything I can. And naturally, she's too soft and, you know, does the thing in District 11, and then it's too late. But it's like, she doesn't want the revolution. And it's, <laughs> but they've just kind of chosen her and made her this weapon because she is inspiring. And I feel like mm. it's such a testament to Suzanne's writing of like, there's so many tropes and characters that I usually get annoyed with. And I'm never annoyed with Katniss about it. Yeah. I'm usually always so annoyed at like reluctant heroes. Yeah. Someone's like, I can't be the chosen one. I'm like, skip, whatever. Yeah, like, you're going to eventually. Like, let's on. get to where they accept it. Or, like, characters who are, like, naive and don't know what's going on. Because usually I'm like, wise up. Like, look around you. But with Katniss, it's so well written. You understand her so well that it's like, I'm never annoyed with her for all these things that I'm usually so annoyed with in other times. That is so funny. I totally agree. She's never annoying because it's like, even when she's like, I don't want to be the revolutionary or whatever. In other books, that would be annoying. But for her, she's like, I literally can't, Prim can't die. My like family can't die. Like her priorities are so clear that you do get it. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't read Divergent, but Harry Potter was very, very much like my era. And when he's like, I can't be a wizard. Oh, I'm just Harry. And yeah. I'm like, an <laughs> ogre just walked through your door. <laughs> Obviously. There are things that you did not know about. Yeah, I was kind of frustrated in the third book that she kept like, and this this starts in the end of the second book that she just like keeps blacking out and waking up and blacking out and waking up and blacking out and waking up. I was like, and, and this happened in a lot of different ways of like, well, yeah, that would be frustrating to if that was your life. And I think like, normally I don't love first person narrative, but I think like, I was digging on the Tumblr after I finished it because I still have that because I, I needed more. This is the first time I've ever read fan fiction was because of this series. You got to get that that era between between the end of book three and before the postscript. But and I want to I literally yeah. I want to read. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll say it. Um, they, they on Tumblr, they said, like, you always only ever know as much as Katniss knows. Mm-hmm. And I think like and as frustrating as that can be, you are also so well situated within her as a character. And you are, you are so 100% in that experience, which is so amazing. There's no space between you and the character. You know what struck me? Yeah, 100%, like literally 100%. And I so appreciate that too, because we're really on Katniss's journey. Like mm-hmm. the fact that everybody's deciding to revolt and she doesn't know about it until the last second. The other thing I was going to talk about was... um. What is so amazing to me in these books is that, and this this is like in the same theme as the Tesserae stuff, where it's like, it's used to divide you. And obviously the Hunger Games are used to divide the districts, but it's like, even though Katniss is aware of that, she still hates the careers. Yeah. She still hates them and they still hate her. And even though she knows like we're just being pit against each other, like she does still hate them. But what's amazing is in like those certain, and we, we hate them too. Like they're horrible. Like Clove is horrible. Like she's with the knives and, you know, Glimmer is so shitty. And like, obviously Kato is like the epitome of like the career. 
But what it kills me about this book is when we are reminded that those tributes are just kids as well. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that when um, Katniss goes to shoot Cato at the very end, it's described as an act of mercy. Mm -hmm. And he's just moaning and he's whimpering. And the last words he says are please, Mm -hmm. as in like, please do it, just kill me. And it's like, we, and we see the same thing with, with, clove when she's about to get killed by thresh like her last thing is that she screams out for help she screams out for kato Kato. yeah yeah for kato you can only imagine that maybe kato and clove had a romance just like pita and katniss did or a friendship you know obviously like like her last impulse before she died was that she wanted to be taken care of she wanted to be saved like a child wants to be taken care of and those are the moments in this book i'm talking like mostly about the first one like where you're just reminded these kids are fucking 15, 16, whatever. And like, they've been brainwashed, but they're all just kids in the arena. And like that last moment where Cato is killed as an act of mercy is like such the epitome of that. It gets me. There were so many like breathtaking, truly like movie magic moments in the book, just in the text. And I'm going to watch the movies like maybe once October is over, but like the salute to Katniss, to Rue, but also when Cato has like Peta and is about to kill him. Peta, like in his own blood, draws an X on Cato's hand. Suzanne! And it's like Cato realizes it a second after I do. Boom. So good. So and the wolves ripping them apart, like the mutations ripping them apart. And they look and they look like them. I said, Suzanne, this is not appropriate for children. We have to talk about the arena. Oh yeah, we gotta discuss just the layout. Number I one, thoughts on this. I'm excited to yes. yeah, talk. Also, dive number, in, dive in. number one, Suzanne Collins is a genius. Like, it's just amazing. The fact that she came up with all this stuff is Mm -hmm. amazing. But the the layouts are always so interesting to me. The fact that like the first game is basically the forest where Katniss Mm -hmm. shines. Like, is that luck or is that the capital seeing a really well liked? That's gonna be a good story. And and basically being like, well, we don't want her to die. Episode one. That's not good TV, girl. I mean, I, that was exactly what I was going to bring up was I wrote down the question, how planned do we think this all is? One, what you were just saying, Kira, like, yeah, maybe it just happened after they saw that she got an 11 and after she was so good with the arrow and so loved, maybe they were like, okay, let's plan this entire arena around this girl. But in the second book, it's implied that they spend the whole year making the arena. So in book one, I've heard this conspiracy theory before that they purposefully chose Katniss because the rebellions were already kind of starting these uprisings. Mm -hmm. And they thought that if they could kill Katniss, like there's a conspiracy theory that I don't know if I fully buy into, but I'm just saying in terms of planning, people are like, did they almost build this for Katniss so that they could destroy her and like kill the spirit of the nation? You know, I don't know if I buy into that, but in terms of like planning it perfectly for Katniss, like there is a lot of evidence that points to that, like the forest, like you were just saying. And also there was this quote that I pulled out that was like, she's talking about her arena outfit. She's just been given her arena outfit. And she says like, these boots are better than I expected. They're not unlike the boots that I wear at home. And it's like, okay, so did they kind of plan this whole thing for her in some way? I I feel like it's not above the capital. And I think Mm -hmm. this is why the hunger games is so scary and there's really no way to prepare for it is that so much of whether you live or die is just the layout and also luck Mm -hmm. like annie the girl who phoenix in love with yeah she wins the hunger games is like i think it's hers where there's a big flood and because she's from the water-based district she's like the only one who survives and knows how to swim like that's just actually sheer dumb luck and I feel like there's a lot of moments like that of like you could just be in the wrong place at the wrong time but also it's the game makers who decide like when this happens and as we've seen with like what is it Plutarch in the second yeah. one he is very capable of keeping Katniss alive as the game maker so it's just I always never know like how much the game makers are doing in the first book specifically yeah like do they 
plan who wins because like you just said with the annie example annie would be one of only two who knew how to swim because of the yeah. distance easily like you were saying i would love to have a book like from the game maker's perspective and just separately i would love like a novella uh well, I mean, maybe i wouldn't of like Peta's perspective of like the first half of book three and the very end i think that maybe would be too dramatizing to read but like i, I want to know what was he up to i feel like the first one it had to be somewhat tailored to Katniss because mm-hmm. of her popularity pre-games not because of the, the forest thing I feel like yeah you could get away with the berries of it all the poison berries that like only if you lived in a forest would you have this knowledge like the fact that it kills Foxface who could have easily won the whole thing just by hiding and lying low like even putting the berries in the game feels like something that would help Katniss. And I noticed at the very beginning of the first book, when Gail and Katniss meet before the reaping in their little private place, they're eating berries. People have the theory that Foxface purposely killed herself. I forget if this is in the book, but in the movie, they show her when they're training, she's Mm -hmm. doing all of the berries training and all of the poisonous. She's like teaching herself all the poisonous things. So Some people have a theory that she like purposely killed herself, which I don't know. I go back and forth on that. Honestly, every time I read it, I'm like, because her whole thing is that she's so cunning and she's so smart, Mm -hmm. but maybe she just trusted that those berries were fine because Peta and Katniss picked them. But all I'm saying is the tailoring and the fact that like Katniss knows those berries, which means they probably only grow around District 12 because it's region specific. Mm -hmm. The entire like realm is is basically District 12. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah it has to be because of Peta and Katniss's popularity yeah. right yeah I think so I mean it's really interesting how much the game makers I feel like every time they shoot themselves in the foot they do so in the pursuit of making good entertaining television oh yeah yeah it's a lot of miscalculations on their part because it's like maybe they did design the whole thing so that Katniss would have an advantage but then they probably thought they could control Katniss yeah but then they didn't. And it's like the same thing with in book two when they choose all the victors, they think this will snuff out whatever, but they can't actually control the victors. They have to walk a really fine line. And the fact that the guy, oh my God, why am I forgetting his name? The game maker of the first book. Seneca? Seneca Crane. Seneca Crane. It's like Seneca Crane. (laughs) Oh my God, the weird weird ass beard. Oh yeah. Seneca was hanged i'm sorry i would kill for a book from the perspective of the game makers because i just oh, absolutely you know, i want to know what they were thinking like i want to know what his plan was i want to know what the instructions he got were and like why he chose to plan it around katniss is was he maybe in on the revolution like plutarch like i don't know it's like you have to make television that fuels the propaganda of the capital but it also needs to be good tv and those do not always go hand in hand. Yeah, everybody loves an underdog, man. Yeah, it's so true. It's like even the capital civilians love an underdog, but loving the underdog is like antithetical to keeping the capital in power. So it's almost like they're working against their own interests. Mm-hmm. It's like how like revolution is often baked into the framework of whatever is being revolted against like for example like people even say like in america like if you look at our founding documents blah 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 blah. this isn't necessarily like i'm just saying it's like the idea of like freedom and da 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 like that in itself ties to like abolition and it's like Mm -hmm. you can't really be like super like oh well i'm pro freedom and i'm pro all these things if you're not also pro like abolition and you're not pro like the upturning of that same very structure and i feel like we see that in these books too where it's like well you're pro the underdog you're pro all these things but actually like your downfall is baked into your very foundation and so like the revolution is kind of inevitable does that make sense yeah yeah Yeah. it's it's always such an interesting moment to me in two when Peta drops the greatest line in the whole book if it weren't for the baby and he does the smirk if it weren't for the baby but the fact that all the capital people start rioting they start going cancel the games stop the games they have to turn off the lights they have to shut down the whole thing because like the people of the capital like district one the elite of the elite are like stop the games like don't do it like that's so interesting to me but I feel like it also kind of shows you like I feel like Effie is also such a interesting yeah character to analyze of like these people 
might not necessarily be like bad people. They must be bad people to enjoy the Hunger Games and not see it as something awful. But does Epi see it as something awful going into it? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Like she doesn't go into it like Hamish. Hey, she goes into it like kind of excited for the pomp and circumstance of it all. And then only through like personally getting to know Peta and Katniss, she's like, oh my God, wait, no, you guys are like kids. Yeah. Like, I wanted to know how you guys like read Effie when you were young versus now, if that had changed at all. Because I like, I saw like, this is a person who is nervous for these kids. I think it might not be like these kids specifically, but I think like to some degree, I, I think maybe she's wrestling that as we watch her in the first book of like of these kids are gonna die but these are my kids I feel like in the beginning or at least like reading it as a kid Effie at the beginning seems like a bad guy just because like Katniss in her monologue is like I know I'm gonna die but at least I saved my sister and she's like we have to plan what to wear (laughs) she's kind of funny like that like she is kind of weirdly comic relief yeah like a serial tragic way but I think at the beginning she doesn't necessarily care about Katniss and Peter and I feel like you see that when she draws the names like mm-hmm. she draws the names in the first book it's like Peter Malark on the uh, next and then in the second one when she's crying mm-hmm. when she pulls the names like I feel like she doesn't start off caring right. about them necessarily because she doesn't mm-hmm. see them as human yeah, That's point. she is totally the stand-in. Yeah, I think when I was younger, I just read her as probably funny and as like comic relief and as like maybe more evil, but, or I maybe sort of liked her. I don't remember, but I think like reading it now, it's like she's sort of the stand-in for like the privileged person who's never had to confront their own whatever, who who's never had to confront any problem, but it's like now they do. And like they do have empathy and they like are kind or whatever. So they're actually able to like learn and grow. And I kind of love that we get that in a character. Like I love- That we have one character from the capital who like does learn and grow and like ultimately ends up on the right side. I think that's really cool and very unique and provides nuance, which is very crazy for like a YA book like that. It's almost like that moment where Katniss, I think this is in the second book, she's getting prepared by her team and in her head she's calling them kind of dumb and stupid and stuff but then she sees how nice they are to her mom and then she has Mm -hmm. this moment where she's like I feel bad that I look down on them so much who knows what I would have been like if I'd grown up in the capital maybe like I would only care about what party happened and you know maybe I would sleep until noon but it's just that circumstances are so different and your environment is so tutorial about like how you end up which I'm realizing also reflects on what Kira was saying about the games itself like it is luck it is your environment like so so much of whether you thrive or die is based on how well you're in sync with your environment and like that's what the games are based on but that's also like a big theme of the book is like your environment and like mm-hmm. how you're changed by what's around you and like that is luck and it is arbitrary to an extent damn I could talk about this book for hours yeah I know you kind of have to go well we can wrap this up I want to keep having this conversation like, down let's do it we could do part one we, we, we got into the first book but like we didn't even touch on Mockingjay. No, no, no. I thought it was a two-parter. Oh, yes. And I just want to cap with one quick little story, which is that my high school was a little like Harry Potter. We had houses. We had four houses. I was in like the English and writing and history program. And you had about 60 kids each year. And you had like a head of house who was like your, your head teacher. And ours was our English teacher who was this like nerdy, scrawny man whose parents literally were a former priest and a former nun. And he like wore Tabasco ties and sweater vests. I loved this man. And throughout high school, we had him every year. We were always asking him, who do you think would win of all 60 of us in a Hunger Games? Who do you think would win? Who do you think would win? And so it got to a thing of like, if everyone like turns in their final project, there's something like that. And senior year, he would like have a whole class where he would walk through like one through 60, who dies and won, which is in hindsight, the most twisted thing. I was like the fifth last to die, which I was very honored by. He was like, well, Aaron has a lot of Girl Scout skills. So obviously that she is also very small, can hide in a lot of places. And then ultimately it ended with these two students, like, again, this was all murder and he had like deaths for each of us. And so at the end, he was like, these two people like shoot each other and there's no one left. And we're like, that's weird. That's weird. And he's like, and then, and I'll bleep out her name. He was like, then woke up, 
she had been asleep the whole time because she always sleeps in class. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. That's really then, funny. He sounds like a chiller. He was so funny. Okay, wait, I do have to go now. Yes. I have to start my sleep routine. Go for Bye, it. Bye, guys. Bye. Okay. Excited to do part two soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. We have to do another Hunger Games episode and it will be coming very soon. Next week, if you listened very closely to episode three, Cupid Doesn't Flip Hamburgers, Adrian and I mentioned that we were in a writing trio in college. Well, the third member of that trio is coming to join us next week. Brandon Gintro, the closest thing I have to a brother, is coming to discuss Percy Jackson, book one, The Lightning Thief. It's a delightful episode with a delightful person. Brendan, I love you. All right, I'll see you then.